Uh, Pastor Ralph is away on his second week of holidays, and I think he did a deal with our friend, Pastor Mike Kleinhaus from the Center Church. Mike is going to speak to us this morning, and we're really looking forward to that. Come on up, Mike. Well, good morning. It is good to be here. It's a beautiful setting. I love it here. This is, this is gorgeous. And, uh, and such a blessing to be able to, to join with you, to, sp- to, to share God's word with you, uh, to worship alongside you. Um, I want to send greetings from the Center Community Church. We, we share a building. We're there in the afternoon, but we're also outdoors in the summertime. We meet at, uh, not here, we meet at Memorial Park at 4 p.m. Uh, and so I'm doing double duty today. I'll be joining us, uh, my, my church, this afternoon and worshiping there. And, uh, and it's, a, it's to be outdoors. It's such a blessing. It's such a, uh, a, a wonderful opportunity and experience. Um, yes, being indoors is good, especially if there's a snowstorm going on. But when it's sunny like this and when it's beautiful like this and when we can be here together, there, there's just that sense of community, sense of joy, sense of connection to God. And uh, when I was asked to, uh, to, uh, to, worship, uh, to lead the, the sermon today, I, I thought, you know what? There's one passage that... Uh, uh, for me, speaks of, of God's faithfulness and God's creation sort of intertwined and how it's a, just a, a beautiful image of what we um, are called to be as, as Christians. And that's a, a tree planted by living water. A tree planted by living water where we find our, our sustenance from God. And uh, there's Wonderful examples of trees all around us, of, of, of trees planted by this, the river that have grown up and they thrive because they have uh, a source of, of uh, nourishment. In, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, uh, chap- uh, verses 3 to 11, is a fairly f- common passage called the Beatitudes. And it talks about being blessed. And, and the thing is, when we, t- when we think about being blessed... We think about, for some people, the first thing that comes to mind, well, if I'm blessed, that means I have everything that I need. I got, I got money, I got, I got a, a roof over my head, I got shade from the sun, which is a necessary thing when you're bald. Um, but being blessed by God doesn't necessarily mean that we have all the creature comforts. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have uh, everything there. What, to be blessed means that we have... Uh, peace and contentment. And, and if you read the Beatitudes, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for there will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. And if you read over that list again, you think, okay, well, wait a second. The meek, sure. Okay, the poor in spirit, okay. But those who are persecuted? Those who, who are, are mourning? It, it doesn't feel like that's a, uh, that's a blessing. And yet God says they are blessed. They are blessed when, when they're looking to God. Because here's the thing. Storms will come in life. We are going, I I think everyone here sitting here will say, yeah, I've faced adversity. I've faced trials. I've faced problems. I have faced health issues. I've faced this. No one sitting here can can say to me, yeah, I've had a perfect life. No, No, none of us can. We've all faced problems. Uh, Paul in, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 13, he says this, I am not saying this. He was talking about to the, the church in Philippi how they had supported him and he was thankful for it. And he's saying, I'm not telling you this because I need. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content. I've learned to be blessed, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in each and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength, or I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And most people put that last little bit on the coffee mug or on a plaque in in their house, and they say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But that's not what that is saying. What it is saying is I can be blessed in all circumstances. I can feel God's peace and his joy and contentment in all circumstances because of Christ. 
because of what he accomplished. That's the secret of being blessed. That's the secret of finding contentment. And we can only find true blessing through knowing and being known by God. And a big portion of that comes through being rooted in his word. And that's what we're going to look at today. I want to read the passage that we're going to be... You thought that was a sermon. No, we're just getting started. Um, We're going to be uh, looking at Psalm 1. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your phone, you can pull out your phone. Um... And you can take a look at Psalm 1. We're going to be staying in Psalm 1 most of the morning. Uh, We might be dancing around a little bit, but for the most part, we'll stay with Psalm 1. And I'll read the psalm, and then uh, I'll pray, and then we'll we'll, we'll dive in a little bit deeper. So looking at Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Father God, as we come before you this morning, as we worship you in uh, in fellowship, as we worship you in song, as we worship you in giving, uh, and now as we worship you in looking into your word and studying God, would you bless us? Would we sense and know your peace and your presence here? Would we understand your goodness for us? And Lord, would we apply it to our lives? I pray, Heavenly Father, that if there's anything that I say is not from you, would it be quickly forgotten? But what is from you, Lord, would it take root in our lives? Would it go down deep? Would we bear fruit so that we can reflect your Son, Jesus Christ, more and more each day? And we ask this in his holy and precious name. Amen. 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 So, going through this psalm is what we're going to do today. We're going to look at Psalm 1. And if we look at the first verse, we've got, blessed is the one. Blessed, the one who finds contentment, the one who finds peace, the one who finds joy, not in what is listed first, who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Those people who who find themselves there are not blessed. And and the basic thing about that is is, is the question that that arises, where where are you getting your information? Where are you finding your direction for life? Where are you looking uh, in order for you to have knowledge and wisdom? Are you looking to the wisdom of this age, of the, wis- the wisdom of this world? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it talks about how, how God has brought in what seems to be foolish in order to thwart the, the, the wise of the world. That the wise of the world look at, look at the cross, look at Christ, and they think that's silly. That's silly. How can, any, how can any good come of that? How can anything wonderful come of that? And, and God uses the weak. God uses those who are seemingly um, insignificant to shame those who believe themselves to be wise. And so if we find ourselves trying to find wisdom, trying to find knowledge, trying to find direction from the things of this world, the, the author says that that is like walking in step with the wicked. Have you ever, um, have you ever seen a, an army walk or march, especially if they're on parade? They walk in unison. They walk together. And it, it sounds like, if you listen closely, it sounds like just one footstep going boom, 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 boom. And they're all marching together in unison, all walking the same direction in unison. They're all doing the same movements. Oh, in fact, if someone trips, it's, they stand out. If someone is doing like an arm wave backwards, they, they, they stand out because they're not in unison. If they're walking in step, that means that they are walking together. Now, for us as Christians, we find, we are, we're called to find unity with one another. We're called to find unity with, with Jesus at the cross. But for those who are walking opposed to Christ, we should not find unity. We should not be unified with them. We should not be walking in step with them, whether that means that we're walking with them or we're following them online or we're watching from a distance. We don't walk 
with the wicked. We don't get in line with what they think. In, in the ESV, it says the counsel of the wicked. That means how they teach, what they teach, what they're, are, how they're directing their, their lives. Those who are wicked are actively opposed to God. They're living for themselves. They're living for what they can get out of this world. They have put themselves in the place of God and saying, everything needs to revolve around me. As followers of Christ, we cannot, cannot align ourselves with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take. Think again to that army marching along the, uh, in the parade. Those who are standing along the, along the road, watching them and cheering them on, they are identifying with that army. They are in agreement with, they are supporting and encouraging them, even if they are from a distance. We aren't called to stand in the way that sinners take. We're not called to walk and step with them. We're also not called to sit in the company of mockers. Now, we have to make, um, I have to know there's, there's a difference here between um, sitting with, with sinners, because we know that Christ, with Jesus, he sat with sinners, he ate with sinners, he was found with sinners all the time. But he was not agreeing with them. He was not living like they lived. He was not trying to um, win their favor. In fact, oftentimes he would speak out against them, even as he was having a meal with them. He would preach and he would teach about the kingdom of God, about the love, the justice of God, but, and he would say, you guys need to change. That's not what's happening here. Those who are sitting with mockers are sitting in agreement with them. Now, a mocker is someone who belittles someone who tears down, someone who insults another person for personal gain, someone who is looking just to score points and, and is, is vindictive. They look for ways to attack others, to make fun of, and to tear down with, or treat with contempt. And we see this so much online. In fact, I, I, I often, I, I get upset when I see Christians or those who, who, are, who are saying they're Christian who are actively joining in in mocking and in tearing down and in, 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 in breeding disunity. As Christians, that's, that's not who we're called to be and not what we're called to do. Even if we disagree with someone, to paint it on, online and, to, and to, to join in with mockers is not what we're called to do as Christians. You're not going to find peace or blessing. You're not going to find joy or contentment there. What you will find is anger, rage, malice, strife, division. And these are all things that are opposed to the fruit of the Spirit. It's all stuff that, that, that Paul talked out against and said, if you are going to be a follower of Christ, these are things you cannot be a party to. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what we're called to be and called to do. And how do we get that? Where do we find that blessing? Where do we find that peace? And the answer is in the, verse, the next verse. We know the truth. Blessed is the one... In verse 2, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. How are we able to counter the wisdom of the age, or any age for that matter? How are we able to, to go up against what seems to be wise in the ways of the world? We know the truth. We embody the truth. We are filled with the truth. Uh, there's a, a story it is a story. It's not a true story. It's just a made-up story, but it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful illustration. Um, Zurich, Switzerland is very famous for diamonds. And there's a story of a boy back at the turn of the century, not this century, but this previous century, so a long time ago, long before any of us were around. And this boy would go to a jeweler's, lived nearby a jeweler's shop, and he would often walk by and see the jeweler working in the window. And he would see the jeweler making these fantastic, wonderful, uh, beautiful works of art that would be worn and adorned. Uh, and, and he wanted 
to be a part of that. He wanted to learn this craft. He wanted to learn how to be a master smith, master jeweler, and make these wonderful things. And so he walked in as a young boy and walked into the, the, uh, the jeweler and said, how do I do this? How can I, can I learn this? Can you teach me how to do this? And the, the jeweler looked at him, did a little quick little appraisal, which jewelers do, uh, and said, yeah, I can teach you. Here, hold on to this. And the boy looks at it and is like, what is this? He says, this is a rough diamond. And the boy looks at it in amazement. This is a, he's, look, he's like, I'm holding a diamond? I'm holding this diamond? And, he, and he's amazed by it. And the jeweler says, I need you to go and sit over there, study this diamond. Look at this diamond. Look at every little different facet. Look at all of it. Feel it. Smell it. Taste it. Do, but know this diamond understand this diamond. And so the boy goes over and sits down in the corner and he sits there for 10 minutes. And he says, I'm done. And the jeweler looks at him and says, no, you're not. Go back and sit. So he goes back. After two hours, he goes, I'm done. And the jeweler says, no, you're not. Go back and sit and study and learn and know. Well, he does that all day. And at the, at the time the, the, the shop is closing up, the jeweler says, you've done well today. We'll see you again tomorrow. And the boy's like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to come back. Tomorrow I'm going to be able to make, make beautiful rings and necklaces. And I'm going to be carving. And, gonna, and he's all excited. And he goes off and he sleeps fitfully that night because he's waking up the next morning. And he's going to go and he's going to make beautiful jewelry. And the jeweler sees the boy come in in the morning. He says, okay, here you go. Here's, hold on to this. And he's like, I did this yesterday. He's like, yeah, you're not done yet. So he goes and he sits. He thinks, okay, well, I'm not going to go to him in 10 minutes. He waits all morning. And then he goes to the, to the jeweler and says, I, I'm done. He's like, no, you're not. This goes on for five days. Five days, a whole week of going and sitting and just holding this diamond, this rough diamond. And he goes back on Monday. Because at that point, they had two days off. It was, it was all, Zurich was very progressive at the time. So they had a full weekend. He goes back Monday morning. He sits down, and uh, the, the jeweler comes to him and says, Ar, here you go. You need to know this. And the boy's like, this is the last day. If I don't do something different tomorrow, I'm quitting. This is not fun. I'm not learning anything. He holds the diamond again. He puts his fingers all over it. And he's like, yeah, I know. Okay. The next day he comes, the jeweler hands him. A diamond. And the, the boy says, before he even that happens, the boy says, like, listen, I want to learn something. I want to do something else. This is getting boring. I want to know all about diamonds. And he, the jeweler says, before you do that, here's this. Hold on to this. And the boy takes it. And he says, what is this? This isn't a diamond. Because he had learned exactly all about that diamond. And he knew that that wasn't a diamond. It looked like it. It was different. But because he had studied it and internalized it and he had known it, and just by touching it, just by holding it, he knew that it wasn't real. Friends, as we study God's word, that's what it's supposed to be like for us. That this, this, not that, this is our diamond. And we're supposed to hold it and know it and read it and learn it and study it and get it to the point where when we come up against something that isn't true, that isn't from God's word, we know it just like that because we know this inside and out. We understand God's word. We understand his law. We understand what he has said to us in it. And so that when we come up against something that isn't from his law, when we come up against something that is not true, we will know. And we'll be able to say, you know, that's not from God. That's not real. We are called to know the word, that we take delight in the law of the Lord, that it is something that we find joy in, something that we find satisfaction, something we find peace in. When I see that word delight, I think of my, I think of my spouse, I think of my wife Amanda, and I think I delight in her. I find joy in her. S the same way we need to find joy and delight in God's word. That it needs to be something that when we pick it up, we know that this is right, that this is true, that this is good, that this is from God. And notice that it's not just something that we do, you know, once a week on Sunday morning. Or maybe once a, a day. This is something that we are called to meditate on day and night. So last week, my wife and I, we had our, our 24th wedding anniversary. And so we went out to a nice meal. 
And we sat down and we had uh, like, it was a slow, slow meal. We enjoyed our, the, enjoyed each other's company. We enjoyed the, the meal. We were taking pictures up because you know, Instagram. Um, and we were having a, a wonderful, wonderful time. And we realized after we were, you know, walking home, that it had been over, the, over two hours just sitting and enjoying that meal. Breakfast. Breakfast, I'm done in five minutes. Breakfast, I'm like shoveling food, I've got to go, got to get on to the day. We so often treat scripture and scripture reading like breakfast rather than enjoying a meal. We just want to get through it, get on with our day. And the author of, of this psalm says, no, we need to delight in it. We need to take pleasure. We need to savor. We need to slowly go through and take our time. Enjoy what God is saying to us. We devour it. We savor it. We know it. We're familiar with it. It is the thing that is quick to our mind when we are in the midst of, of trouble, when we're in the midst of turmoil. It's the, something that is quick to our mind when we're reading or looking at, at news and we see something and we think, hey, that's not from God. That's not good. We're watching something on, on Netflix and we think, that's not, that's not true. That's not right. Why? Because we know his law. The other thing with meditating on day and night and, and taking delight in it is that this is something that affects our whole life. We apply it to our whole life. Here's the thing with, with, with the Bible, with God's word to us. We are called to adjust to it. We don't adjust God's word to our lives. We allow God's word to shape us and to mold us, to help us become more like Christ. We take all of his counsel, everything that is contained in here, and we apply it to our life. We don't pick and choose. We don't just stay in the, in the, 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 the book that we like or the verse that we like. We take all of God's counsel, and we fit our lives into it, not vice versa. There's so many times where I want to just take what I like, where there's some stuff that I, I read about in Scripture, and it's like, oh. I don't like that so much, <laughs> or I don't understand it, or it doesn't make sense. And, and those are the, the things that at first, you know, you, you, you want to pass over, you want to skip over really quickly, but God says, no, slow down, take your time, devour it, savor it, spend time. Because here's what happens when we do this. Here's what happens when we do take the time, when we do allow God's word to speak to us. Verse 3. That person, us, we are like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. You grow. You flourish like a tree planted by streams of water. You have what you need. You have satisfaction. You have peace. You have contentment. The opposite of that, of not having what you need, it leads to all sorts of trouble. There's a, um, the, the center, we, we do a lot of work over at King Albert Public School. And uh, I remember when we first started there, I was talking with the, uh, the uh, principal, and she was saying how there's a lot of need in the school. And a lot of the need that, that comes, that is there, is actually uh, food related. Because you have some, some families that are, struggle with food security. And so that's part of the reason why at the center we've, we, started, we helped uh, um, continue on a food program that had already been started. The organization had to step away, so we stepped in and we continued it on. So every Friday we make chicken noodle soup for the school. We usually start later on once it gets a little bit cooler. But every Friday we make soup for the whole school. And it really stems out of this um, story that she told us when, we, when uh, my wife and I first went and visited with her. She talked about how there's these two little boys, they're twins, and... Monday morning, they came to school and they were already a terror. They were bouncing off. This is even before they got in the classroom. They're they bouncing off the walls. They're, they're, and they were JK, by the way, four years old. And they were creating havoc on the school ground. And, and the teachers, they're like, they're like they, these kids are out of control. They're just crazy. And the teachers couldn't, couldn't contain them. Again, they're four years old. And so... 
the principal went out, so they called, they walked in and, and said, listen, th these kids are, they're, they're, they're creating all sorts of trouble. Can you come give us a hand and, and help us out? And so the principal went out, she gathered, gathered, gathered the two little boys in, again, four years old, creating all sorts of trouble. She brings them into the office and she says to them, are you hungry? And they're like, yeah, yeah. So she feeds them. They, she had uh, uh, instant oatmeal in, uh, and so she boiled some water, put, put a thing of instant oatmeal before each of them. They wolfed it down. She did it. Do you want some more? Yep, wolfed it down. Three, four, the four years old, three bowls of, three bowls of oatmeal for each of these little four-year-old boys because they hadn't eaten over the weekend. They hadn't had, and they didn't have what they needed in order to, to study, in order to sit down. In order, they were just not well. But as soon as they had food, they were totally different. Why? Because they had what they need. As Christians, if we don't have God's word as our food, then we don't have what we need. And we are going to act irrationally. We're not going to act in line with what he has called us to be and called us to do. When we have God's word in our lives, when we apply it to our life, when we are living by it, we're going to do what we're supposed to do. We're going to yield our fruit in season. We're going to respond and act in a way that glorifies God. We're going to demonstrate how things are supposed to actually happen. Our leaf will not wither. I took that to heart to mean, you know, we're not going to burn out. Because here's the thing, if you're, if you're following God's word, if you're doing what he asks you to do, you're going to take a Sabbath. You're going to rest. Every week you're going to find a day where you are resting, where you are cutting off from everything else. Every seven years you're going to find rest. You're going to take a, a longer break because you need it, because we are designed and created that way. You are not created to work seven days a week. You're not. God did not make you that way. When you try to work seven days a week, you are going to burn out. Your leaf is going to wither. You eventually will no longer be effective. We're called to follow his word. His word is good and great and, and true. And when we follow it, when we live by it, it says, whatever they do prospers. We will prosper. Now listen to me clearly. Being prosperous and prospering does not mean you are financially set. It does not mean that you will have everything that you need financially. It means that it will work out, that our lives will work out according to God's purposes and plans. In Romans 8, Paul talks about how all things work, to the, work out for God's good in our, in our lives. According to his goodness, according to what he wills, and according to what he wants. This doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that everything is going to, like there's not going to be any sickness, that there's not going to be uh, times of, of, you know, want where we don't necessarily have as, as much money as we want. Uh, but God says you're going to have what you need. You're going to be satisfied if you're satisfied in me. Bad things might happen, but God's purposes will still be seen in your life. You will have peace in the midst of those trials. You will have joy even when all around you seems to be failing. You'll have contentment even when you people around you think, well, how can you be satisfied and content with what's going on? Oh, and the answer is very quickly is because of Christ. Because of Christ. Because of who he is and what he has done and what he has accomplished. That's why. And people will see and people will say, I want that. I want what you have because here I am chasing after all these things of the world and I don't have peace. I don't have joy. I don't have contentment. So if we do this, if we read and know and understand and put God's word into practice, we will be that tree planted by streams of water. We will produce fruit in season. We will have leaves that do not wither. We will prosper. But, not so the wicked. What happens if you go against God? What happens if you try to do things your own way? Well, the author says that those people are like chaff, not like a tree, not like someone, something that is solid, something with roots, something that is held there, that is sturdy, that is stable. Chaff, if you've ever experienced or watched um, 
watched people uh, thrash grain or thresh grain, and they, they knock all the, the good things out, and the chaff is left there. The chaff is substantial. It just blows away. A, a, a breeze comes along, and poof, it's gone, and it's gone. It's no more. You, don't, you cannot go out and search for the chaff. Why? Because it just becomes part of the ground. There's no roots. There's no substance. There's no connection. It's blown away into oblivion. And that's what God says here. They're like chaff. The wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. They will be cut off from God. That's harsh. But it's meant to be. It's the truth. If they are not finding themselves in God, if they're not finding their peace, if they're not accepting him, they will be removed from his presence. Though people might seem to prosper in this life, and I should do the prosper thing, though people might seem to have it all together, they, they might have, you know, the, the two cars and the boat and the, and the going away on, on trips, they might seem to have everything, it won't last. It doesn't last. They can't take it with them. Psalm 37 talks about that. I'm not going to read it right now, but if you look at that, it talks about how those who seem to have it all together, one day they're here and the next day they're gone. The righteous, though, those who are found in Christ, those who trust and hope in the Lord will be in God's presence for all eternity. We won't be cast aside. We won't be thrown out. We won't be forgotten. We will be with God in his presence, in perfection, in his love, in his joy, and that will never be taken from us. That's God's promise to us. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. He is with us. He is with us continually and constantly. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. So how do we do this? How do we stay rooted in God's word? How do we become like trees planted by streams of living water? The first thing is what is this, delight in God. We are called to know the author. We are called to know and be satisfied with him above all else. As we know God and as we know the author, we will find peace. We're called to meditate on his law, to study it, to ingest it, to savor it. That it is something that we hold on to. It is something that we go to daily and, and, and that we think on daily and many times through the day, not just once a week, not just in passing, but this is something that impacts our life. And that's the third thing, we do what it says. So we delight in God, we meditate, and then we do what it says. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Live it out. Be changed by God's word. Be conformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus, so much so that others see it and others know it and others are affected by you. It would be useless if every time that you look at the word, you just forget it. You go out and you think, it doesn't change you. It doesn't make you more like Christ. I want to end off with this, though. And this is my caveat. Studying God's word knowing God's word, meditating on God's word, it only works and it's only possible for, you, for it to affect your life if you've humbled yourself and accepted God and accepted Jesus' offer of grace. If you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, doing what I have just explained and just said won't change you. If you're trying to do all of this, all of what is contained in Scripture, if you try to, to live by this without accepting Christ, without, without putting, making Him Lord of your life, you're going to fail. You are going to fail. You're not going to succeed because you're not perfect. Even if you miss up once, if you lead a perfect life but you only mess up once, You've fallen short. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. All of us have messed up at least once. No one here is, is sitting there is like, I'm still good. I'm, I'm still good. I've made it this far. I haven't messed up yet. No, we all have. All of us have fallen. All of us have, have fallen short of what God has asked us to be and God asked us to do. And so we cannot do all of this and make our way to God. It's impossible. The other thing about that, though, is this. 
We can't make our way to God, but he's already made his way to us in the person of Jesus. He has come to us. There's no reason for us to try to find a way to him because the way is Jesus Christ. He's here. He came here to us. He came to save us. He, he demonstrated what it, what we're called to, how we're called to live. And he said, you guys can't do this, so I'm going to do it for you. And you got this problem with sin, so I'm going to take that upon myself. So he came to us to make a way for us to be saved. If you try to do all of this in order to win more of God's favor, so say, say you accepted Christ and you, and you try to do this to win more of God's favor, uh, that doesn't work either. In fact, the opposite will happen. If you try to do everything in order to say, God, look how good I am, you become some, sort of like a Pharisee. You become very prideful. You put yourself in God's place. You said, listen, I'm so good, you need to look at me. That's not what this is about. This, in fact, is meant for us to see God more clearly. We're supposed to look through Scripture and see God amplified and see and understand more of who He is. So if we try to win God's favor, we're just going to be puffed up like the Pharisees. Or the opposite could happen where we are so filled with doubt and shame and guilt because we don't live up to it. If we don't find our our peace and our satisfaction in Christ, if we don't receive our, our salvation through him, we're going to feel left out. One last thing, if you try to earn more of God's love by just doing everything in here, if you try to make yourself more lovable to him, it doesn't work either. This is good news though. This is really good news. Why? Because he already loves you perfectly. If you had perfection plus perfection, you still got perfection. You cannot have perfection plus one. God loves you perfectly. He loves you so much that Jesus Christ came and gave his life for you. You've already got his love. You don't have to earn it. It's there for you. And so and when, we, when we recognize this and when we understand this, when we understand that our, we are loved perfectly by the creator of all, that he cares for us, that he knows us, he knows all our shortcomings, he knows our failures, he knows our, he knows our faults, and yet he still loves us. When we understand that, then this is no longer a burden. It becomes a joy. Because we don't have to earn his love. We don't have to earn his acceptance. We've received that through Jesus Christ. And now instead what we get is we just get to, it's a privilege to do what he has called us to be and called us to do. We have his peace. We receive his joy. We get his contentment. And we get to live as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as little Christs going off into the world. And we don't do it in order to get more gold stars, we do it because we've already received his seal of approval. He says, I love you. You're my child. I'm proud of you. Go forward and do what I asked you to do because I'm already there with you. I'm going before you, making a way. I will be your rear guard, guard watching over you. I will be your, in your presence. My spirit will be with you, so Go. Know that you are loved. Know that you are accepted by me because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And we get to go and do it in his name. I'm going to call the worship team forward and I'm going to pray as, uh, as they come up. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, God, that because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, we can now uh, be accepted by you. We can come into your presence. We're accepted not because of how good we are, but because of how good you are. So, Lord, I pray that as we look to your word, would your spirit guide us and direct us? Would your spirit allow us to know who you are more, more clearly so that we can honor you with our lives? I pray, Heavenly Father, that your word would be a delight to us, that we would find our joy in it, and, God, that we would be blessed by it. God, would others see you in us? Would they be drawn closer to you because of us? Because of your goodness and your love that is displayed in our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.